to introduce you briefly, uh, uh Bobin. Yep. Bobin. So yes. I just I just read through your usual. We are live. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our fourth. Uh, I think this is our fourth day of a live uh, streaming of uh, talks with photographers from Southeast Asia, uh, together as part of this uh, Kinabalu Photo Festival. So uh, tonight with us is uh, Mr. Zhong Wubin. Uh, he's a teacher for me, <laughs> teacher, and is actually a writer, curator, and artist. So for tonight, so tonight he will present uh, something about the way of documenting. So Wubin. Thanks. Thanks for the uh, introduction. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, thanks to, uh, special thanks to uh, Jabat and the organizing teams uh, and also to Kevin Arkin uh, <laughs> for organizing this event. Uh, I'm very happy to be back. Uh, I was, I think I was, uh, previously, I think I, I managed to catch the Kota Kinabalu photo week. First edition, uh, I think. First edition. The first I one. Think. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. So, so I saw the, probably I, you can say that I saw the early germination of, of this event. Uh, so I'm very happy to be back. Uh, I'm glad that Jabat hasn't forgotten me. Uh, <laughs> We uh, never forget and, you, Mubin. And uh, it's also really interesting to look at how the festival has developed over the years, especially from a distance, and to also see that uh, the team at uh, Kinabalu Photo Festival, you know, uh, instead of maybe doing the usual stuff, uh, actually looking towards our neighbors in Indonesia, in Singapore, and having a dialogue and inviting people from neighboring countries and territories to come and share their experiences with uh, the people at the Kinabalu Photo Festival. So I think that's quite interesting. I remember, I think Jabat introduced or invited Eric Prasetya, you know, uh, Danny yeah, Salman. Yeah, the second from, edition. Yeah, from Romy from Perbawa as well. Romy Perbawa. Uh, and now I, I noticed that yesterday, you, you were hosting talks for Edwin Tuyai from Philippines. Yes, yes, yes. So it's, it's quite interesting to see how, you know, instead of doing what other festivals might be doing, you are, you are looking from within the region to try to share experiences and to learn from one another. So I think my talk today will be very much in the same spirit. Um, so before I begin, I will share my screen. Kevin, later I will need your help for the video. So today I'm going to give a presentation. I, it's, I titled it Ways of Documenting Photography in Southeast Asia. Um, when, we, when we talk about documentary photography, photojournalism, or let's say street photography, we often just use these terms quite easily and maybe quite loosely. We often assume that we understand what we are talking about or what we are referring to when we use the words documentary photography or street photography. But these terms are not neutral. These terms are also given to us uh, from the outside world. And the definitions of this term are, of course, you know, quite clearly defined, strongly defined by famous practitioners from the West. Uh, so I, today what I'm going to, 
going to do is actually to kind of take a thought experiment. So we're going to do a kind of experiment. Instead of thinking about documentary photography or street photography, I want to invite you to kind of suspend your definitions of this term, to temporarily forget the definitions of this term, and to try to come and understand what is the possibility of documenting in Southeast Asia. Uh, so I'm going to take the most simplest definition of documenting, which is the act of recording what is in front of the camera. And this act is continuous, ever-evolving, ever-changing. So my question is actually, what does it mean to be documenting in Southeast Asia? So, and why are photographers documenting? And then from that question, we are thinking about what are the possibilities and limits of documenting and how do they circulate their work? Today, I'm going to talk or compare the practices. To do that, I'm going to compare the practices of four photographers, Lam Tham Thai from Vietnam, Alex Baluyut from the Philippines, Eric Prasetya from Indonesia, and Vandi Ratana from Cambodia. So the four photographers are really from different locales in Southeast Asia, different generation as well. There is obviously a limit in my presentation because I should and I must actually include also female practitioners. But for tonight, I will just limit my comparison to these four photographers, four male photographers, which is obviously a serious limitation. But this is, of course, a kind of like, this is, a, this is an ongoing work for me and very soon I will be writing about. I will, I will include a women practitioner in the conversation here. Uh, so I'm going to compare the four photographers and their practices. And I will do that by looking at their work and their biography individually. And then at the end, I'll kind of compare them and to try to answer the question that I've set out today. The first person is Lam Tham Thai, actually. So here is a very quick um, biography of his life. Um, this is a portrait of him as a soldier photographer. Uh, I'm going to narrate or I'm going to show you his work primarily from two books that he published. Um, this is the first book that he published. It's called The Ho Chi Minh Trail, published in 1997 with an edition of 1,000. Basically, this is a record of two trips that he made on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, starting from February to June 1966, and then the second trip, July 1974. Right? He is basically... He is basically a photographer that was born in the Mekong Delta here. And this is really a record of his involvement in the Vietnam War. I think most of you might remember the Vietnam War. I don't really like the term. I prefer to call it the Second Indochina War because the Vietnam War seems to give the impression that this is a conflict that's limited to Vietnam. But in fact, this is a conflict that affected the entire region, including places as far as Thailand and the Philippines. And the Ho Chi Minh Trail is basically a supply line that went from the north to the south, supplying uh, the forces in the south. So Lam Tham Thai is basically somebody that was born in the Delta in the south, but was sympathetic and working for the communist north. And then this book records two trips down this very famous Ho Chi Minh Trail. And if you notice, Ho Chi Minh Trail actually cuts into Cambodia and Laos. So this is how actually, from a geographical perspective, this is a conflict that's not limited to the two Vietnams at that time. So I'm just going to very quickly show you some of the images. So you can see actually it's a fairly straightforward record of him as a young and excited photographer soldier on the journey down south. And I'm going to give you a quote that he gave to Tim Page in a very famous book called Pictures of the War from the Other Side, Another Vietnam. Uh, so this is Lam Tham Thai basically trying to explain how he got involved in uh, the Second Indochina War. 1965 was the year of escalation. I was drafted and ordered to go down south the Ho Chi Minh Trail. For us Southerners, it was a great honor and opportunity to be selected to go south. 
especially as a photographer, only the most physically fit were chosen. We were motivated not only by, sorry, by patriotism, but also by a youthful spirit of adventure. So there was for him a sense of adventure of participating in the revolution in support of the communist north. So from the moment we jumped off the trucks in Guangbin province, just north of the de demilitarized zone, I clicked that East German made camera nonstop for four long months as we walked down the trail to the far south. I had such energy, most of the time I would run uphill ahead of the supply convoys, convoys or climb up hillsides to get better angles of the trucks and men winding down, winding through the mountain passes and crossing bridges. So he was a soldier attached to the supply uh, troops going down south. He was also trying to make good photographs, obviously. So you can see that he's trying to, he, here he is seen trying to describe how he would make better photographs by running ahead, finding better angles. But as he went further down south, he became more and more tired. And of course, he saw more and more death and destruction on the way. And that also drew him, made him uh, quite tired. And this is a really interesting book. I'm coming back to the book itself. In the sense that it also, it's also a book that tries to imagine what it is to have a kind of unified or liberated Vietnam. And so here, there is a section really about the ethnic minorities that they met. And the book tries to write their involvement into the liberation movement from the North. So these are photographs apparently of the ethnic minorities that supported the communist North. And you can see quite a lot of nice photographs of, of them you know, participating in the revolution, friends, friendship being made, you know, people saying goodbye at different points. So it looks on the surface like quite a pleasant book. But the reality on the trail itself is actually not like that. Because in after the war, there were a few initiatives or a few, yeah, a few initiatives that tried to record, you know, the experience of the war for different participants. And actually, the people that were on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, on a daily basis, they would be seeing, you know, like wounded people, you know, or people who were killed. So it was far from a kind of like pleasant uh experience as seen in some of his photographs. So in other words, his photographs don't show everything. You can see, for instance, uh, let's say we take this quote of somebody who was involved uh, in the trail. So he said that on the, on the, on the trail going down towards Kong Tum, every day we saw groups of wounded soldiers coming home. Some of them had been burned by Naupon. Others were deformed or blind. We used to say to each other on reaching on arrival in the south, try to keep your faces intact. So that was actually the reality on the trail. But in this book itself, you don't really see this very scary experience of working on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. You see the difficulties, yes, but you don't see the, you know, the death and the wounded. And then months before, slightly before, a short while before he passed away, he published another book. It's called The Wartime Photographs. This time published in 2000 and also an edition of 1000. So this is a photo book that he published shortly before he passed. So edited by him, well, not edited by him, but at least a, like he saw the book being made. He approved of the book being made. And in this book, you can see again, it's a kind of like a more chronological way of presenting his involvement in the war. So you see that here he, uh, he starts his involvement in 1965 as the soldier photographer. And you of course see, you know, musical performances staged and performed for the people. 
in the liberated zones in the south. During the Second Indochina War, for photographers typically working for the communist north, uh, very often they were not allowed. Well, they photographed the combat scenes, but they were often not allowed to publish these images of the actual fighting and the actual conflict. They also typically don't publish and publicize images that show death. Um, but Lam Tham Thai, in this book, he was also, because I think he knew that his time was also coming to an end, so he tried to push the possibilities of what could be published. So of course, this book is published 25 years after the end of Vietnam War. And you can see that this image on your, is this, I think, on your bottom right of a, of a dead soldier with his stomach cut open. Usually, this kind of image would not be publicized during the conflict itself. And he tried to include this image as a way of trying to push what was possible. But of course, many, many, many decades after the actual event. And then in this book, there is a section on the very famous Tet Offensive 1968, uh, where the Communist North actually liberated Hue in central Vietnam for a short period of time. And as you can see again, there are photographs showing the preparation, but there's no real photographs showing the actual conflict. But Lam Tham Thai himself was actually on the ground in Saigon when the Tet Offensive was happening. He, in fact, lost his eye because uh, he was shot in the eye during the conflict. So he was definitely on the ground. But in this book itself, you still don't see much of the conflict. Here, I'm just going to show you how typically the images were shown during the Second Indochina War. So they actually set up all these mobile exhibitions in the liberated zone, typically in the south. And then they would display the images either for the soldiers and for the people who live around these liberated zones. And here you can see him trying, perhaps trying something more expressive in his way of uh, photography. And it's also important to remember that at that time, the conflict between the Communist North and the Republic of Vietnam in the South was often pitched against, you know, Vietnam versus, you know, the foreign imperialist. So from the Communist North perspective, they were fighting a liberation against the U.S. imperialism of the South. Uh, and so actually at that time, it would not be... I mean, to, at that time, to suggest that they wanted peace instead of fighting the revolution would not be something that uh, would be acceptable to the state of both sides. So peace was not something that they wanted to portray. But many decades later in his book, he could, of course, reflect upon the cause of the conflict. And this image, it doesn't look very striking, but it's actually a very striking image in the sense that uh, in this image, they were, this is actually the peace accord in 1973 where the North and the South met. And in this image, right, you, will see, you actually see that uh, representatives from the Communist North in negotiation with representatives from the Republic of Vietnam in the South. And so this image actually tells the attentive viewer that this is actually also a conflict between two different Vietnams with two different sense of nationalism. So it's not as simple as what his, uh, the side that he was supporting, Communist North, right, was portraying. It's not so simple as liberation against the US imperialism. There was another conflict that was really between the two Vietnams, the North and the South.
And here again, you know, reflecting on the cause of the conflict, such an image, I suspect, probably wouldn't be published during the war in itself. And again, you can see how the images were shown in the liberated zone. Okay, with Lam Tham Thai, from Lam Tham Thai, I'm going to move on to another example, another photographer. His name is called Alex Baluyut from the Philippines. Uh, so here is a short biography of his uh, photographic career. He's actually known for two very famous photo books. In 1987, a year after the fall of Marcos, he and Lenny Limjoko published a book called Kasama, a collection of photographs of the New People's Army of the Philippines. So the New People's Army is actually the left-wing army that was active in uh, the north and also deep south in Mindanao. And then in 1995, he again won the National Book Award with another photo book called Brotherhood. And then he also helped to establish the Conrad Adenio Asian Center for Journalism at Ateneo de Manila University in 2009. So this is a portrait of Alex Baluyut. I'm going to actually talk mostly about his second book, which is called The Brotherhood. It's published by the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism in 1995, 97 pages. Uh, it looks like, uh, I mean, it's a rough and ready book. It's not a very, it doesn't look like a very precious photo book, but actually it's one of my, uh, one of my favorite books for its rough and readiness, in fact. In the editor's note, uh, the editor, Sheila Coronel, who is a very famous investigative journalist from the Philippines, she introduced the book. So here are some quotes from the quotations from the book itself. Certainly, Brotherhood is not a pleasant book, but it tells us in very graphic terms the reality of everyday life at a police station. Some parts of the book are damning, but other parts are quite sympathetic to the policemen and the circumstances under which they work. We recognize that in recent months, there have been earnest attempts to reform the Philippine National Police. We welcome these reforms and hope that they go further. So this is actually a book about the Philippine police and how they work on a daily basis. And so the Philippine Center of Investigative Journalism commissioned Alex Malou to do this book, to spend six months at, uh, at, a, at a district police station, stalking basically the police, following them around and looking at how they work on a daily basis. And it's not... It's not a nice book. I mean, it's not an easy book to... Uh, I mean, it's not a pleasant book because many of the images are quite graphic. And actually, it's interesting that the book starts immediately by, you know, looking at a photographer, uh, a, a police that was shot while he was uh, in action. But most of the time, you would actually see police, uh, well, the, the police force using all sorts of means to um, exercise their authority in Manila. So this is not a kind of like Hong Kong gangster flick. This is actually uh, the experience of Alex Baluyut at one particular uh, police uh, district. For me, when I look at the book, it's quite interesting in the sense that sometimes you don't really know who is, you know, the law enforcer and who is actually the outlaw. The, the, the line between the two is not always so clear cut. But at the same time, the police were under a lot of pressure to do a lot of things in Manila. So the book, I can't say that the book is sympathetic towards the police, but it tried to portray also some of the tribulations of the police force in Manila. And so basically, Alex was with the police for six months. He did everything uh, publicly. He was not hiding around. He got access. He asked for access. So the police clearly didn't think that there was anything wrong with what they were doing. And so he could photograph 
what he could photograph. So here you can see the police, how, how do they interrogate suspects, right? And then after that, he basically finished most of his images, but the editors were not very happy because I think they, they wanted more blood or violence. And then suddenly the there was out of the blue or you know something happened in the Manila City Jail. And there was a kind of like uh, revolt in the jail. And Alex was also there, so he photographed uh, one of the prisoners taking hostage, uh, hostage of a child. And then the police would come in. And then the final image of the book. And if you follow the, let's say the current affairs, of current events of the Philippines today, right? You wouldn't, of course, you might have heard of the war against the drugs uh, in, in, in the Philippines. It seems like, so there is a certain sense of like deja vu in what Alex was trying to photograph in 1995 and what is actually happening now in the Philippines. I'm going to just excerpt because he wrote a kind of like photographer's note. Uh, and I'm going to just excerpt some of what he said from the book itself, just to give you a sense of how he understood what he was doing. I thought that the subject matter of this book should be best approached in the documentary tradition of photography. So how does he define this tradition? He says that which is to immerse, then the images unfold before you. So every day for several months, I was at the Western Police District Headquarters at United Nations Avenue, joining the ranks of ambulance chasers and night stalkers. So there were, of course, other photographers also shooting at the same time. Every photographer there was driving past me in high gear, shooting pictures that landed daily on their newspapers. My work required a different mindset. I didn't have to produce photographs every day. Only the thought of a book, months in the offering, kept me going. Documentary photography can get downright lonely. Then he describes to you how he shot his work, which is basically the technical aspects of how he shot it. And, you know, unlike the other police beat photographers, so these are photographers who are sent by the newspapers just to cover the police beat or the police news. So most of them would shoot with flash. But in Alex's case, right, he typically didn't shoot with flash. So he's using a 400 ASA or ISO film and then push to the limit. So probably 1,600 or 3,200 ISO and then so that he could shoot in low light. So it's, the police kind of realized that he was photographing in a very strange way, but they still allowed him to do so. So they didn't feel that whatever they were doing were anything problematic. On the night of November 26, 1993, I shifted to high gear when the Manila City Jail riot took place and a headline event fell on my lap. With all the blood and drama, it was a photojournalist's dream coverage. When it was all over, I knew that I had the last strand that made the image complete. So I was talking about the editors being not satisfied, right? They, they, they wanted a bit more blood and drama. So in the end, the jail riot happened in 1993, November, and that allowed him, Alex, to finish the work. And before he published this photo book, there was another book that he published, which, is, which also won him the National Book Prize. It's called The Kasama, a collection of photographs of the New People's Army of the Philippines. I'm not going to show you, uh, it's actually photographed by Lenny Limjoko and Alex Valoyut. I'm not going to show you a lot, of, a lot of images from this book. I'm just going to actually go to the section where Alex contributed, which is actually the left-wing uh, army's zone in Mindanao in the south of Philippines, not far actually from Sabah. So these are, of course, activities of the New People's Army in the south. And there was this, there is this very important image where the MPA, so the New People's Army's guerrillas actually 
caught an informer and then they trial the informer and then they kill the informer and then they bury the informer. So this image was, well, these few images, uh, Alex was very insistent on including these images because when they were about to publish the book, uh, the people that were involved with the New People's Army uh, were not very happy that he was publishing all these images. So Alex had to insist and said that if you don't want to publish these images, then he's not going to be involved in the book. So in the end, he was able to force his opinion uh, on the publisher to include all these images, which would not look good for uh, the New People's Army. So here you can see that he's trying or he was trying to kind of exert his sense of independence or his sense of autonomy in relation to the content of this book. And this is a very crucial feature of how he defines his documentary or documenting practice. And I will come back to this towards the end of the presentation. The third photographer that I'm going to talk about is somebody that I think uh, some of you would have already met in Sabah. His name is Eric Prasetya, and this is a short biography of the exhibitions that he has been involved in. Uh, I put in also Ayu Utami because Ayu is actually a family's author and now the wife of Eric Prasetya. And I, I believe that a lot of Eric's work has been somewhat influenced by Ayu Utami. And so she's the founding member of the Alliance of Independent Journalists. She's better known as a writer. And these are some of the novels that she has published. Uh, and in fact, she has published a, well, she has co-authored a book together with Eric Prasetya. It's called Banner Aesthetics and Critical Spiritualism. But today I'm going to talk about Eric's work. And this is a work that spans 20 years. It was later published as a photo book, and the photo book title is actually called Jakarta Banner Aesthetics. Banner aesthetic basically is a kind of, let's say, ethical and aesthetic framework that Eric developed to describe his documenting practice. I believe that Ayu has consciously or unconsciously influenced uh, this idea of banner aesthetics. And I'm going to briefly describe what he means. Banner aesthetics on one level is a kind of response against the work of, let's say, somebody like Henri Cartier-Bresson, where you can see that we know Bresson is famous for, is known for the idea of the decisive moment. But for Eric, he feels that this sense of decisive moment where all the elements fall in place, the visual elements and the compositional elements fall in place, this sense of the decisive moment is largely connected to the idea of painting. In other words, it's not a sense of aesthetics that is, I mean, photography could, in his sense, in his belief, photography could probably do more than, than that. And he is interested to use banner aesthetics to find a kind of aesthetic framework that photography could provide. And so you can see in some of his photographs, and I, can, and I think you can remember some of the earlier images which I flashed, uh, the composition seems really strange and awkward. It seems as though it's like a random snapshot. But this is actually part of what he was thinking in relation to the framework of banner aesthetics. At the same time, banner aesthetic is also a kind of ethical reaction 
against the work of Sebastian Salgado, which I'm quite sure uh, many of you would be familiar with. And in 1994, actually, Salgado came to Indonesia to shoot one of his major projects. And it just turns out that Eric was his fixer, together with a few other photographers. Um, so he had the experience of looking at how Salgado worked, and he brought Salgado to a very poor slum area called the Chilinching in Jakarta. And so this is what the experience uh, that this is what the experience of working with Salgado meant to Eric. So over the next 40 days in 1996, Salgado went to the slum area of Chilingqing in Jakarta 10 times. Eventually, I realized I cannot be like him. His images are too beautiful and more often than not, they direct us to images from the Bible. And people like that kind of work, especially in rich nations. Salgado said that people at Chilingqing have pride in poverty, but this is only because he was there with a camera. This is not the reality. The problem is that he and photographers like James Snatchway sell it as reality. And then later on, Eric and Ayu, in the book Banner Aesthetics and Critical Spiritualism, they revisit this episode that he spent with Salgado. And then here he says, Salgado is known for his propensity to provide dignity to the faces of the laborers in his photographs. However, we, even with his good reputation, he still inflicted some discomfort on those he photographed. The people living along Chilingqing, a very poor area at that time, would mock in Javanese language, I hope you're happy with the pictures you took of us poor people. So working with Salgado made him conscious that he could not be like Salgado. Of course, and, and he later mentioned also the fact that he doesn't, English is not his first language. He doesn't have the language to um, apply for major funding nor to get uh, major assignments from uh, international media. So he couldn't really, I mean, he could not really aspire to be Salgado in any case. So, so Banner Aesthetic was also developed in relation or in resistance against this kind of work that he experienced by working or following Salgado around when he was photographing in Jakarta. But you can see in Banner Aesthetics, there are some images that still have a kind of, if you want to say Salgado imprint in the sense of composition, drama, darkness, uh, yeah, but most of the images in Banner Aesthetics are not similar. So his proposal in Banner Aesthetics, I mean, it's quite an interesting proposal. I will just share some of his ideas here. Photographers undoubtedly seek assignments, but photojournalistic assignments, either for hard news or human interest photography, seem problematic. The photographer's reputation is determined by the aesthetics of recorded facts. Here, the, photo the photograph becomes an object for the, for the photographer that the photographer will try to control to fit his framework of approach. The more dramatic and aesthetic an image, the greater its value will be. What he actually tries to say here is that most of the time, if I'm New York Times, if I commission a photographer in Sabah to photograph something, a, a, you know, a subject, I'm employing the photographer because I already like her or his sense of aesthetics. So I will give the photographer a certain deadline and the photographer goes to the place with a very short deadline and with a, a very with the pressure to complete the assignment. Very often the photographer will just end up using her or his sense of aesthetics and then fit it on the people that he photographed. So the person that he photographed becomes just the object. And in this case, the more dramatic the more aesthetic an image, the greater value it will be. And you can, in a way, you can also say that this does not only affect journalistic assignments. This is also the case or the basis of, for instance, you know, competitions like World Press Photo, right? I mean, the more dramatic and aesthetic an image, the greater value it will be in a competition like World Press, right? So, so he, Banner Aesthetics want to try to move away from that. And in his case, He's proposing that photography is trapped within this subject-object dichotomy, further sharpened by other problems like the class, gender, and culture of the photographer. 
Can this dichotomy be reconciled? Maybe not. But at least it can be minimized while we continue to be conscious of it. So he has chosen the following steps. Huh? Photographing sections of society that are not considered my other. Photographing without assignments or time constraints. When he talked about point one, right, I can put it in a simpler way. Most of the time, photographers are from the middle class. But if you notice, right, photographers are almost always interested in the, the lower class or the class that is of, of, and the higher class. They are, very, they are often not that interested in the middle class. So in this sense, right, he's trying to talk about the possibility of photographing sections of the society that's considered his class, which is the middle class. And then he wants to try to move away from the pressure of assignments so that he doesn't have to fit a certain kind of aesthetic onto the photograph person. But he's quite realistic as well. He doesn't, mean, he doesn't believe that just doing these two things, the problem of the subject object, the photographer and the photograph person, he doesn't believe that just doing these two things, it will just disappear. So the idea of banner aesthetic is to always be critical of the photographer's involvement in this dichotomy, the photographer and the photograph person. So he then, in this work, he decided to focus on the middle class. And at that time in Jakarta, a popular way of transport for the middle class, the intercity transport was, of course, the real, the train system. So he spent a lot of time on the train system photographing pedestrians and, sorry, photographing passengers going in and out of Jakarta. So these are people traveling to work, traveling back from work. People who are living in and around Jakarta. Then he developed a small series on the cafes, the bars, the pubs, and also the disco areas, nightlife, and of course, middle class, the shopping mall. But this work is also a kind of biography of his politics. When he entered the Institute of Technology Bandung in the 1970s, he was the political, he was the student leader of the, 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 the I think the year one or year two students. So he was very early involved in politics. And at that time they were already, so in 66, 65, Suharto, came into power by 70, by the late 70s, and certainly when he was in Etebe, they were already agitating uh, against the government. After, after the 70s, he left activism uh, and was involved in other things like mountain climbing and rock climbing before returning to activism in the middle of the 1990s. So during Reformasi, during 1997 and 1998, uh, where 97 the Asian financial crisis, and then 98, um, which led to 1998, the fall of Suharto, he was actually on the street also, together with uh, the protesters, photographing the movement that brought down Suharto. And he was not there to do any assignment. He was basically there to see what he had been trying to fight for since the late 70s, come to fruition on the streets. So he was there to leave a record, to make a record. So this work, in some ways, is a kind of political biography of Jakarta. Eric is not from Jakarta. He was originally from Padang. So Jakarta is actually his adopted home. If you look at the entire project, it's really a kind of biography of this city over 20 years, intertwined with his own uh, story as an activist. And then he developed, towards the end of that project as well, he developed another work to kind of uh, also challenge or unmake you know, the photographer, the photograph person, the subject-object dichotomy. And this is a work that he did in collaboration with Ayu Utami. So his then partner, now wife, 
it's more a work that was directed by Ayu Utami and Eric in this case becomes the person that executes what Ayu Utami wanted. And he also became the object. So both of them entered the frame, they appeared in front of the camera, and then they became the objects of uh, the camera. But this is a project that was largely directed by RU. So in this sense, Eric had to kind of relinquish his control. So this is actually the project introduction in From Last to Trust 2002. Writer Ayu Utami invites her partner, Eric Prasetya, to create a photo essay on Sado Masochism. Eric relinquishes control of the camera by shooting with an inbuilt timer as both of them enter the frame to perform and create the visuals. Before that, Eric had tried to photograph women in his work, but he was always unsure if he was really interested in the shoot or if he merely wanted to see them in photographs, see the woman in the photographs. The collaborative nature of this work allows Eric to approach Ayu on equal terms. Here, he's simultaneously the photographer and the performer, the object and the subject. Basically, Ayu wanted to create a photo essay or photo story on the idea of SM to illustrate a lecture that she would be delivering. So this is the set of images that she created in collaboration uh, with Eric. Basically, she was directing Eric and to create all these images that she needed for the lecture. So you can see Eric and Ayu both in the frame. That's Eric at the time. So here you can see that in this second work, he has moved even further from what he was trying to propose in banner aesthetics. Okay, with that, I will move to the fourth photographer that I'm covering today. His name is called Vandi Ratana. He's a Cambodian photographer born in 1980, so much younger than uh, the previous three photographers. This is a very, well, this is a, this is, his uh, biography and all the shows that he's involved in. If you notice, he is more involved in exhibitions rather than, you know, making books. And I'm going to talk about just one project that he's very well known for, and this is the series called The Bomb Pond. Uh, so it's a series of nine photographs, short or medium format, uh, of these crater lakes that can be found in the countryside of Cambodia. I'm going to show, and then there, there is actually, he also made a documentary film to accompany these nine photographs. I'm going to show you a video, a short video, introducing this series of work where Ratana and his curator will talk about uh, the project. Uh, let me exit first and then can you share the images from your side? I have a very strict principle when I make pictures. I don't really touch the reality. So I don't arrange. I just let life you know, has its own life. So he was working on this project uh, titled Walking Through, where he was photographing uh, rubber plantations in Cambodia. These rubber plantations are um, were introduced uh, during French colonization. One day when I was uh, making pictures, you know, in the plantations, because I, I saw a big, perfect crater and I didn't know what, what, what it is. I didn't know. And suddenly there was um, a young farmer that turned, turned himself around and said, that's the bomb pond. And I was, what's, you know, what's, what, what, what's happening here? These are physical um, remains of military operations by the United States during um, the Vietnam War. 
So these were bombs that were dropped between 1964 and 1973. They are craters, essentially, filled with water, uh, water that was toxic for a very long time. Um, there aren't very many other um, traces of the bombing. There is a certain level of uh, exoticism that the artist is playing with too. When you look at the image, you do not see military operations. You do not see uh, the developments of Cambodia. You do not see the history of the Khmer Rouge, for example. And that, I think, is quite interesting because it requires looking further into that history, trying to understand what is it about these very perfect ponds. They're perfectly circular. Um, what about this is appears so natural and yet so artificial at the same time? That kind of image haunted me about a year until late 2009. I decided to you know, try filmmaking. My friend used to work at that journalism school, but uh, they decided to give us uh, the HD, you know, very old HD <laughs> a cassette, you know, we have small tape, you know, that kind of camera, but it, 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 it was nice. And uh, we just went around the country about a month. He had managed to find information about where some of these bomb ponds were located. Uh, it is information that was only made available publicly um, by the U.S. government in 2000 of the approximately 2.7 million tons of bombs that was dropped in Cambodia. In a way, Ratana is documenting this uh, portion of history that is forgotten. Of course, I don't really know about my own history until I started the bomb ponds work. So I started to do the research. I found um, a Cambodian scholar who lives in exile in France. Now we are very good friends and he tried to explain me everything. So my young Armin Berlin in Hana, Jock Jordan Hanan Ban. Loser so Madal, Luz so Madal, Madang, dear T Tang, Jock no Tina, Adang. Dalla Pil Perkin, the Luzo, tonight won't take your maw. Maw young to Luzo, young mud, non pon jola. And for a young upon him. I cried on Todd as I crop by with Tom Pig. มาตําแหน่งมาเลือกตึกใดขมายนั้นไปจราญเป๊ะบ่ยิงรอบเต้าเวรอบมันอ๊อเลยซาตําแหน่งจราญเป๊ะรวจปิ๊บใบ 50 um, near the bomb ponds, who remember the bomb ponds, who were there when the bombs were dropped. And their stories are, are quite harrowing, actually. It is an experience that they cannot forget. <laughs> มวยมวยมือนั่งบ่าไปกั้งบ่านั่งมาตอตังนี้ตําเละตังนั่งเตี้ยให้มือจํางายประมาณประมาณจังอ้ําปีนายขอบมาหมอกขย่มมาจมว
this history, not simply to place blame, but to understand the context of why even this occurred. This was during the Vietnam War. And it's a long history as to why the Americans were bombing Cambodia. They were trying to flush out the Viet Cong, who were basically scattering. I don't have the, the pretense to, to change the world, but to understand, just to, to you know, try to heal myself. Uh, yeah. Thanks. So you can see actually Ratana explains quite clearly what uh, this project is really about. And it's there are a, a few things that I really find interesting. It's a way for him to understand his own country history because this history is not often taught in school. And if you remember when I started with the first photographer, Lam Tam Thai, he was on this Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was the supply trail for the communist north to the south. And this is actually why this is actually that was really the context of why there was bombing in Cambodia because the trail actually went into Laos and uh, Cambodia. Uh, so it is a younger photographer trying to understand his own history and trying to cure himself or try to heal himself from that trauma of history. So I'm going to just show you a few photographs from the series. There's basically nine photographs from this series. It's very simple, in a way, uh, simple records of the relics of the Second Indochina War, which was, as I said earlier, not just a war in Vietnam, but actually a war that affected the entire Southeast Asia. Now, we've the example of Vandi Ratana, I think I've come to the closing section of uh, this presentation, and I would like to return to the preamble that I started at uh, the onset, which is to ask the question of what are, what, is the pos what are the possibilities of documenting in Southeast Asia? And I propose that we might be able to begin answering this question by looking at the work of four photographers, Lam Tam Thai, Alex Baluyut, Eric Prasetya, and Bandi Ratana. So the first question that we might attempt to answer is why are or were they documenting? In Lam Tam, Tam, in Lam Tam Thai's case, he was of course supportive for the Communist North and participated in its political revolution. He was, um, and then it was, well, he was a supporter and then he was fighting against the USA and other nationalist forces in Vietnam, or to be more specific, in Republic of Vietnam in the South. In Alex's case, he was documenting or making his photo books with the intention to change society, to expose its ills. In Eric Prasetya's case, right, it was to express himself, to learn and record his adopted home of Jakarta, to fulfill his dream as an activist of seeing the fall of Suharto, to set an example for younger photographers on how to make, without much funding, a long project, long-term project, and a photo book. In the case of Ratana, he is documenting to learn and record the history of Cambodia, to heal himself from the trauma of his own national history. So how do they circulate? How do they use their photographs? In Lam Tam Thai's case, right, the photographs were exhibited in the liberated zones during the Second Indochina War. So during the war, it was already exhibited or shown. After the war, it was made into photo books and exhibitions. And in the context of exhibitions, these are typically photography exhibitions or exhibitions concerning history, and or photographic art. So his work is often exhibited in these forms. In Alex Baluyut's case, he started out as a news photographer, a wire photographer. So his work was in circulation within the news services. And then of course, he made photo books and exhibitions. And in his case, quite similar to Lam Tam Thai, exhibitions of photography 
history, and or photographic art. In Eric's case, because quite early on, he already, I mean, he, he, he does some commissions, but generally speaking, he does not take editorial or news assignments. So most of his photographs and definitely the work that we showed, Banner Aesthetics and From Last to Trust, were shown either as photo books, his photo books, or exhibitions. And in his case, right, the exhibitions that he is typically involved in would be photography, history, and then photographic art. Sometimes, quite occasionally, he's also exhibited in the context of contemporary art. In Ratana's case, he actually also started as a journalist. And, but more, but after that, his work actually circulates or is exhibited mostly in contemporary art exhibitions. So he is actually quite different from, let's say, Lam Tam Thai or Alex Baluyu. There is a little bit of an overlap with Eric Prasetya in this sense, right? And finally, ways of documenting. How do they approach documenting? In Lam Tam Thai's case, right, he was actually a participant of the revolution. So he was informed, but he was also restricted and confined by the communist North's fight against US imperialism and other nationalist forces in Vietnam. In other words, he had to tailor his photographs or he had to edit his photographs. He could only show certain images and had, could not show other images because he saw his participation as a kind of like supporter of the revolution. So he had to work within the boundaries of the communist north. But after the communist takeover in 1975 and many decades after that, he did, especially with his last book, War Photographs, right, he did try to present a slightly different perspective in his photographs, as I've already mentioned. In Alex Baluyu's case, right, he's, he felt that documenting was for him a way to immerse and to let things unfold. And for him, it had to be a kind of unflinching view of violence and reality. And for him, it's quite important to emphasize the independence of the photographer because he doesn't want to be seen as a propaganda photographer or propagandist. So he has he places a lot of em emphasis on the idea of being independent or autonomous. So that's also one of the reasons why he later became a freelance photographer because he wants that independence and autonomy. For Eric Prasetya, he was approaching documenting, he's approaching documenting through the ethical and aesthetic framework of banner aesthetics, which is to always question this subject-object relationship. In Ratana's case, I give you two quotes. I think it quite clearly describes how he looks at documenting. Qu quote number one, documenting is a question of the repeat cycle of looking and thinking. So for him, documenting is this cycle of looking, seeing, and then responding and thinking. I still claim that my work is not art. I have a very strict journalistic practice. But as I have mentioned earlier, most of the time today, right, his work actually circulates in contemporary art context. So with this, I hope we can kind of be, we can start to begin to kind of create maybe a framework of how our photographers in Southeast Asia have used photography to approach the idea of documenting. And hopefully this presentation has given you a kind of framework of what are the possibilities, what are the limits, what are you know, how are some of the ways they circulate their work and how are some of the ways they approach this gesture, this evolving and continuous gesture of documenting. With this, I end my presentation. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you, Ubin. Actually, it's very, <laughs> very, very insightful kind of a presentation. To be honest, this is like a very... Uh, another, as usual, very mind-opening kind of a lecture because there's even though this all, all of this photographer, 
even though the topics that they were documenting is uh, different, but they actually share the very similar kind of uh, intention, which is uh, documenting. But the way they're being used, like Vendi is for this uh, documenting the war, Vietnam War. The Lam Tam Thai is for, uh, I don't know, Vendi is the one that uh, showing the consequences of war. Would you yep. say then Lam Tan Thai is the one documenting the uh, the he ongoing wars, uh, the conflict. Yeah. Yes. He the was offensive. Of yeah. Yeah. So then Alex Baliyut is trying to show the different side of the police, which is actually still relevant up to this point, actually. And Eric mm. uh, Eric Prasetya is also uh, I have his book, uh, so I understand a bit, but I haven't got the book uh, written by uh, Ayu. Uh, it's a way of very interesting way of trying to rethink uh, how we approach documenting. Not, uh, I think it's, I, I think, can I say it's more like, like uh, uh, going against the ideology of this uh, uh, Western media ideology when they are trying to portray the Southeast Asia kind of media. Mm. Not easy to say, right? Because yeah, uh, and I I also think that it's it's not easy to say, and because I mean for for a few reasons because. Some of them, not everyone. Some of them have. Uh, some of them, of course, they like. For instance, Alex Baluyud used to work for Associated Press before he went down south to photograph the New People's Army. So you could always say that they were connected to Western media, right? Even. Somebody like Lam Tam Thai, yeah. even though he was working for the Communist North, it's not like he was not aware of what was being produced by Life magazine. And certainly he saw the Soviet magazines. So, and he certainly saw, yeah, he certainly saw the Soviet magazines. And so, so I don't really like this idea of the East and the West in a very simplified way. But what I could yes, yes. say is that what I could say is that they are trying to they are trying to make sense of they're trying to do I mean I'm 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 quite sure it's probably intuitive. They are not like we are now trying to explain it yeah, yeah. and to make it sound yeah. very complicated when it's not probably for them it's really intuitive and and well, at least for I think at least for Alex Baluyut, it's quite intuitive. Um, I think with Eric, of course, you can see that he was, and he made this quite clear, that he was responding particularly to Cartier Bresson and yeah. and and Salgado, right? If you want to say that they represent Western photojournalism or documentary photography. Uh, I I wouldn't. I mean, of course, they are icons in that sense uh, yes. of documentary photography. Um, so you you can definitely say that Eric was responding to them. Uh, whether I would then say that this is a method for yeah. Indonesia or Southeast Asia. Uh, I think definitely Eric wants banner aesthetic to be something that hopefully Indonesian photographers can keep in mind. And basically, he's really talking about a framework, which is an aesthetic framework and also an ethical framework, right? Which is really yes. a relationship between the photographer and the photograph person, right? So you can, you can see that even though Okay, even if you want to say banner aesthetic is something that he develops for Indonesia or at least Southeast Asia, right? There is also the impact of the West. It's not as though 
you might say that the impact is negative or positive, but there is still an impact of the West, right? Um, with Ratana, it's even... Uh, Ratana. Ratana, Ratana, I think, because his image is so, the composition, the way they portrays, it looks so simple. I think that is one of the reason why it keep on being brought up to this uh, contemporary kind of uh, exhibition. Because but of the it, way it portrays it. But you know, the, the way you describe this is also quite interesting, right? Because when you are using, like when you're starting out as a street photographer or documentary photographers, your instructors always say, you know, you need to find a special angle or, you know, you need yeah. to be like Alex Webb or something like that. You know, like you need layerings. I mean, the, yeah. the most overused <laughs> word in street photography. Uh, and, yeah. and, but you're not saying that Ratana's work is very simple, right? It's, but it's, it, not, it's, it's not the way simple. It's more like uh, the way he presented, uh, showing the, the craters. It looks so, uh, it, you cannot, you cannot tell that it's a man-made, to be honest. It has the artificial kind of a way it, between nature and man-made. Even though, yeah. un, un, unless yeah. you're looking through the, artist statement or you explore through the photograph then you realize that he is actually working in very strict strict photojournalism kind of a method i just realized it i know i know his work for many years ago but i haven't really uh, looked through the work like what you mentioned just now yeah never thought it in that way i i would to come back to the i i would come back to the the question and just to say that that uh, I mean, they so I cannot. In other words, I cannot make a I cannot make a yeah, uniform yeah. answer for all three photographers. I think they they respond to the West in very different ways. But in any case, right, uh, there there would be something that is quite common to all four of them, and actually, it's also common to me. Probably, is common to you as well. Which is that when we talk about photography in general, most of our references are western west. western meaning actually we are not when we when we talk about western we are not really even talking about let's say dutch or you know or bulgaria or hungary we are really only talking about the usa and uk and maybe france right so yeah. i or maybe a bit of german if you like you know bern and hiller becker and the Dusseldorf school. So, um, but, but I think that that in that sense, it's it's a call the, the Western photographers, the European photographers, and the American photographers are our common reference point. And I don't think that's not the case for the four of them. I think it's probably the same for all four of them. Uh, I mean, they may like somebody more. They may like somebody else less. You know, they may have difference in that sense. So that's our actually common reference. Uh, and then I think they are in their different ways trying to either intuitively in Alex's case or in a more deliberate way or theoretical way like Eric Prosetia because he was trying to, he's trying to propose banner aesthetics, right? In a more theoretical yeah. way, either, either in a theoretical way or in an intuitive way, trying to propose a way of working in... Southeast Basically, Asia. they're just trying to respond, respond in the best way to represent the issue that they want to highlight. Not just the issue, but maybe, yes, the issue, but also maybe oh. in Eric's case, he's not just looking at the issue. issue. He's actually also looking at a way of photographing that he feels comfortable, at least to him. See. Should so, I take the I think first? There is a question, right? Yeah, you saw the question uh, by yeah. Brian Abdul Aziz. I, think. I, I don't uh, Do I know Brian? Uh, uh, quite, when you expose the issue, you are actually exposing yourself to whether the implication of such action is negative and positive. Depends on public perspectives. Do you think there's any act or law to protect you from getting into trouble, <laughs> repercussion from such exposure? Yeah. Kelvin, you understand the question? I'm not 100% sure I understand. I, I roughly, I assume, this is an assumption, but I assume it's more like 
if you to tell you make a series you make a project and then you publish it on facebook let's say and uh, do you do you think is there any law or act that protect us from this uh, being uh, apprehend by the authority <laughs> No. I, 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 uh, yeah. No. But even Malaysia has this uh, very new act uh, for social media. So for those who are curious, so it's quite, it's an official act actually. They pass it uh, Akta Hasutan. I'm I mean, sure you heard of it. Yeah. yeah, but can Brian, are you sure this is Brian's question? Uh, can, is it? Can is ask it when you Bahasa. expose the issue? Ask in Bahasa and then and then and then and then Kelvin can see how what 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 is the actual yeah, question. Let, me, let yeah. me comment to him. Uh, I'm sure he is still with us. Yeah, because uh, Brian, it's actually a very interesting top uh, interesting question uh, because a lot of people are very scared to I, I don't know involved in photojournalism is because of this kind of a thing. Whether yeah. ethically we are, is it okay for us to show uh, poverty to the to the public? You show you know show mm. the bad side. I cannot reply. You know that that is the question when you say. Okay, I I I'll wait for you to to ask the question and then we'll come back to this. I can translate it. It's like. So the um, so Alan, oh so, I think I do have actually because of your lecture is quite uh, interesting. There's a few things also that make me much more curious, especially mm. on. Uh, wait, I cannot write. I cannot read my own writings. Change. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. I think it's the best way to say is that the way of documenting is that the photographer need to dedicate a lot of their time and effort into actually, I mean, like they need to invest a lot of their time in order to make the work successful, right? Then I think that's the only best way to actually uh, make it happen, you know? I mean, it, you, I mean, it depends on what you mean by invest a lot of time because because uh, your actual shooting time might not be very long. It's more of your research and your, you know, background research, contextual research, thinking of your way and your approach. Um, so your actual shooting time is never really very long. So that could be also a possible, I mean, so it depends on what you mean by you need to invest a lot of in, time. Yes, definitely, you need a lot of time in terms of, of commitment kind of things. Conceptualizing and thinking and researching and and researching. I don't mean reading your Facebook and IG. <laughs> you know, that's not called researching. Uh, and not looking at your friend's IG feed. That's not called researching. That's uh. There were some people called it uh looking for inspiration. So okay, I think. I'm not so sure if I can ask you about this. Some of the publication, the reference that you shown, I believe some of the photo books uh, that you, especially Alex Baliut and Alex Baliut and also uh, Lam Tan Tai, I don't think that book can easily be bought, purchased online, right? Yep, yep. Uh, Kasama is sold out, I think. Brotherhood, I probably Maybe sold out. Got... You have to go to... And definitely Lam Tam Thai's book is sold out. And uh, I managed to I managed to I managed to find a copy. But it's you, you have to go and try your luck at the second hand. And sometimes I, I don't know. Yeah. Sometimes it quite randomly it appears online on the second hand. I, I bought a yeah. I, I, I managed to find Kasama because Kasama was the first book. Was long, then you, yeah. I mean, was like long. you've been looking for it for so long. No, I, I wasn't actually looking for it because I'm not a collector. So actually, I just 
I knew that it was out of print and I, I didn't really try to look for it. But one day I was searching for information about Kasama. So I was just Googling and then it just appears and it, 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 seemed, it turns out that a seller, a secondhand seller in Japan have a copy. That's how I got my Oh, copy. I see. Yeah. Because that's how I got I think that's copy. a... Um, I think that's another interesting thing because last time, uh, I think a few days ago, we were discussing about photo books and yep. the way people use photo books now, uh, especially in uh, modern time, they even use it, make it as a part of the exhibition. Yeah. Becomes like a series of catalog of the different kind of work. I think uh, Yumi, that... Yumi Goto, yeah, they mm. did it recently, I think. So it's quite interesting. I haven't looked through it properly. But that, yeah, that's different. nothing new. Uh. That's, that's almost as old as that's nothing new at all. Oh. Yeah, of course. I mean, the, the book as a the book as an exhibition method is not oh, new. Oh, no, it's not new. No, no, no. It's at least a, I, let me think. It's at least depending on when you want to start. If you if you if you want to talk about the conceptual movement, you can say from nineteen seventies. Uh, yeah. So it's the, nothing. Uh, it's nothing. The the idea of making a book as a way of making an exhibition and i think japan was also the pioneer of that also in many ways yeah then actually i'm also interested in the eric and yumi uh are you are, are you? you writings on the aesthetica banal because the one mm. i have is i think it's not the one i have is the uh, photo book i think this is the yes edition. yes they, no this is, seems a, this is a text it's a book it's not a photo book it's a book. I, I need to Literature. look for it. Yeah. Maybe I need to ask around. Hey, you uh, translate uh, so your actually, his friend. Yeah. Jika kita publish yeah, a controversy he's... photo story, adakah photo kita story. sebagai... Uh. You understand? Sorry? You understand? You can, you can help me, all right? Yeah. Is he... Yeah, what, what is he... The... Hello. Your Penang, your Penang, your KL or Penang connection. Uh, sorry, uh, my, my line just, just went out just now. Yeah, your KL line, right? No lah, my I'm just uh just got back. I'm in Labuan now. <laughs> okay. At least now you I have to unify. You, you want to so, you so, want to read that question? Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. The, just now you did it. Well. Yeah. He, he he was saying that uh if we publish a controversial photo story, are we as a publisher given any sort of uh, protection for such action? No. You can, the only thing that you can argue in a very... So we take it like... Uh, uh, we... The only thing that you... Hello, hello? Yep. Yep. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello. Yeah. It's just I unstable. can hear you, but you are. Hello. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no Should movie. I go ahead? Okay, okay. I think. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So I, no, I, 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 if I understand your question correctly, right, I don't think there is much of a, I don't know what you mean by controversial, but, but if you publish something in the public, right, I, Don't think there is a particular law that will protect you as a photographer. Um, I, 
you can only use a very kind of like, for me, a rather weak justification, which is the freedom of uh, information. But basically, I, I, I think that if the state really wants to, or if the authorities really want to kachiao you or, or want to uh, take action on you, I don't think you have that much protection. So you have to be responsible. And, but I, I also have to say that you, you shouldn't be, because I, again, I don't know what you mean by controversial, right? I mean, you shouldn't also scare yourself too much, you know, because maybe it's not so controversial. And also sometimes it could also be a challenge for you to turn what you think is controversial into something that is more subtle, right? I mean, you can do the, you can do the same work in different ways, right? I mean, there's 100 ways to cut the, to, to, to kill the cat, right? You don't have to use the most bloody way where there's a lot of blood on the floor, right? I mean, you can use the clean way to cut the cat. So, um, yeah, so you, maybe it's also a, a sign that if you feel uncomfortable, you should find a way where, where, where you can approach it in a more clever or subtle or more creative way. I hope I answer your question, Brian. So there is another question, huh? your good friend. I want, it, should, I, should I read the question? Yeah, I want to uh, ask, yeah, if someone is documenting a topic where not much older generations that time will su still survive to provide information, how the documentation can keep on going in this situation. So, of course, if you are doing ethnographic work or if you are doing documenting work with older generation, time is, of course, quite off the essence. Uh, I mean, of course, the... the the practical, the practical advice is actually to ex, to work with them as as soon as, as, soon possible, as possible. Yes, to prioritize them as soon as possible. However, if uh, because I, I also work with a lot of older people, uh, elder elderly people, right? Um, sometimes even if they are around, right, their memories might not be very clear as well. So we have to be we have to be aware that what we gather, first of all, is just a kind of account based on what they say at that point in time. And then you will have to use other source materials. So it's interviewing is 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 definitely a, a method. But you are you are also looking at archival work. You might be looking at you might be looking at, uh, you know, like looking at. You might be trying to find older materials, archival sources, old photographs, manuscripts, letters, newspapers. You know, the newspaper archive is of course a very important source if you depending on what you are working on, because I'm not sure what you're working on. Um, family photographs, things that you don't typically think about. And then also you, you sometimes will be, sometimes it will be necessary for you. For instance, if you are focusing on this one family, but this one family cannot actually give you what you need. I don't know what you need. Then you might need to be a bit more creative and work with families that are somewhat related to them, but not them. So your, your subject might be about family A, but because family A might not be able to give you much information, you might need to work with family B, who is a neighbor, or family C, who was their own neighbor, or something like that, or, or even family D, who has a kind of similar background to family A, which is actually your main focus. So you, are, you will have to develop more creative and comparative way of working of documenting as well. Sometimes, and if your question is really about photography, then, then of course, 
this poses a question uh, and a challenge for the photographer. So the photographer will have to find other ways of working. Do they photograph the space? Do they use found images within the family's archive? You know, again, do they work with, let's say, family B, who is a neighbor, or work with another family that is really similar to the family that you want to investigate or document? So those are those are possibilities. So that's what I'm trying to say is maybe it's also a kind of opportunity to for you to change it, change the problem into a kind of like possibility for you to do something creative. I think uh, we've been going on to the same question. Uh, I'm trying to extend it because after we document something, doing mm. things uh, properly, I think the next question after the documenting is the, how to actually show it to the public. Uh, would there be any kind of a consideration needed? You know, uh, how to present the story, things like that. Some people will assume the best way is to make an exhibition. Some people will say photo book is the best way. Would you, would you say that this is another important uh, process uh, for the photographers to consider? The a method yeah. of presenting the work. I think yes, this is uh, uh, nice for those who want uh, listening. Yes, yes, of course, of course. And I think in our social media age, right, we are, everybody is like so driven so committed to immediately share and immediately upload and immediately post and immediately share again and immediately circulate. Uh, I mean, of course, if you are photographing your food, then I mean, the food that you make, then I mean, of course, you can do that. But if you are, if you are thinking about a sense of history, meaning that or a sense of time, meaning that if you're thinking about your work in relation to the broader history and 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 keeping a record, right, then there's, there's, this necessity to always quickly share is not always so important anymore. But of course, uh, thinking about the output is quite important. I mean, some people will be interested in doing the exhibition and Again, it's not about doing the exhibition immediately. It's not about really, once you finish the book, you make the book. I mean, that's, it doesn't have to work that way. Some practitioners, actually, they, they finish the work and, and it might take them another five years before they decide to come back and make the book. So different people have different ways of working. So I don't have a prescription as to how this is going to be done. Uh, because of course, after making the work, if you're doing, if you're documenting, right, it's likely that you have a lot of images and then, and then you would have to edit at some point in time. Uh, and then you might, you might need to write your artist statement or you might need to write your project introduction. And then, you know, you might want to upload onto your website, your Flickr, your Facebook, your IG. Then for the exhibition, you might need to do another edit and things like that. So there is always a process. It's not, it does not have to be so urgent. But of, course the, but of course, the exhibiting, the showing is quite important. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, I'm not saying that if you don't show, there's anything wrong with you. Uh. I mean, some people, they don't like to show, which is nothing wrong at all. <laughs> I get it. I said the thing. Okay. So I'm not so sure for those who are still with us, there's still a lot of, uh, there's a lot of viewers still with us on live. Er, er, or oh, everybody near to, near to sleeping yeah. time. Ti do, ti do. 10.30. Yeah, last time we spent until 11 actually. Uh, I think that's it. I don't have much of a question. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, I, my topic is too, maybe my topic is too com complex. <laughs> it's, it's not just complex. Uh. I think if we can continue, we're going to continue quite long. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, like, yeah. I mean, we, there's a lot of things we can discuss, especially when it comes to Southeast Asia. Uh, I think we can talk about this. Uh, 
see what the let's see if they have any questions and then we can yeah. in uh in topic where what's uh why ways of documenting or anything related it doesn't have to be i guess it doesn't have to be mm. ways of documenting ways of document. mm. that's my question is no question actually i read through your this one the your writings for these uh, photo books uh. I think it's photo books in Southeast Asia. <laughs> no, I just want to listen. No question at the moment. How come no question? Uh? So shy. Saba so shy. It's more like uh, it's like the end of the lecture. Your mind is already filled with a new information. So you want to go to the mamak already, just... right? Waiting for waiting for Jabat uh, to uh, invite everybody to the mamak. <laughs> Need time to digest, and then because he only bring people to the mamak only. That's one. That's why everyone are looking forward to during the workshop. Only for only for teh tarik and prata only. Pisang goreng also. Hmm. No, do you have any? You have anything you want to ask or you want to talk about or how was the how was the photo book? Oh, discussion. The photo book thing, it's actually quite uh interesting for me. It's quite interesting because even though I invited them, uh, they are quite young photographer. Both of them, they are mm. uh. One of them is a major in photography from Lin Kok Wing. Uh, mm. Eiffel student, actually. A student oh, of Eiffel. Jack Yong, right? Uh, Jack Yong, yeah. I'm uh, not so sure if you heard of his work on the aeronautic, Malaysia Aeronautic Space Program, which is I, quite I interesting for bit, me. I saw a bit of it, yeah. Mm. So the thing is, uh, the idea is for me when I started uh, the the talk is actually this is going to be part of the series so for now i approach the young uh, emerging photographers on why they intend to how they intend to present their work and also how they translate it to photo books things like that and then afterwards i intend to uh, uh, maybe uh, get in touch with the publishers asking them what are their concern what are their uh, plannings um, oh, you're gonna write something. Thoughts. I'm planning to la, but I'm not so sure if I got the time la. So there's a lot of things need to to organize. I mean, like yeah. on my own time la. So then afterwards, they're going to ask about the situation of these uh printers. So it's a very very broad kind of a topic. So part by part, mm. but I just try to collect first, uh, get the. Uh, the narrative sort out first, then I try to proceed from that. So that's mm. my intention for the next five years, three years. It's a because when I when I when I read through this uh, uh what uh, the photo book in Indonesia by things by uh, on Aditya, mm. I find it very interesting because I know him personally and I've been following his uh, bookstore online. So it's quite interesting because in Malaysia, we also have those kind of a thing. We started it out a few years ago, but because of our own commitment, life commitment afterwards, we cannot get the trends going on consistently. That's the thing. So I think this is uh, my way of trying to maybe, hopefully, I can document the works of the photographers in Malaysia. Things that they have done so far, like minstrel, uh, quick, yeah, I think he also did a photo book before. I'm not so sure how it is. I haven't seen the copy yet. But things like that. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think the, in Indonesia's case, there's actually a lot of groundwork that has been done. Uh, so right now, what we see is actually a kind of like, it's not a big flourishing, but it's, it's actually because the the, the the population of the people who are really invested in the photo book 
is still very small compared to the 240 million people in Indonesia, right? Uh, but still, we see a kind of like small flourishing of, of the photo book form. But I would, my, my personal experience is that there has been a lot of groundwork being done basically since the, basically since, you can say basically since, you know, like late Suharto period all the way until now. Because it's, it's also people publishing catalogs. You know, because I, I think a lot of people just think exhibition catalog is not a photo book. I'm not so quick to say that. Uh, because, I, you know, it's before you can, I mean, it's a kind of process. It's all addition, it's all like incremental and building up towards the form, right? So when people publish zines, you know, like catalogs and stuff, then dummies, you know, having the space to do exhibition, so it's really a kind of long process, which I think only in the last maybe 10 years, we see more of like, wow, finally we see more of yeah. self-published, self-made. Self-published. I think self-published make it much more accessible because I even myself, I have a few copies uh, of some photographers from Indonesia. The only one I haven't got that I was planning to get is uh, the Flock, Flock Initiative, the Flock Photo yeah. Books. Then there's another one is... Uh, I think you know him, uh, the bad guy in Bandung. Forgot his name. Tandia. Uh, ah, Tandia. Yes, yes. Tandia yeah. photo book. I heard the yeah. stories. Uh, uh, how he do the works. How he tried to restress, retrace his uh, family uh, mm. history, things like that. I think it's quite interesting because actually during the discussion last last few days, uh, both Jack and Fitri is actually. Uh, trying to set up a photo book library. Photo book library mm. that represent Malaysia uh, photography works. Uh. So mm. it's, it's, uh, this is just uh, sharing uh, for those who are listening as well. Uh, it's not official yet. It's going to be a very, a very long process. It's not official yet and then you announce. No, la, not announce. Just sharing the initiative. I, don't, I haven't tell the name of the photo book library yet. But they are planning to do something like that. I'm trying to help them in a way, sharing my collection. <laughs> because I happen to have a few, actually. But you have to, what I'm trying to say is that it's not, it's not just having a space and having a collection. Yes. If you really want, I mean, looking just at Indonesia experience, right? Yep. I mean, the way I would understand it, the case in Indonesia is that you really have to, it's a, it's a whole series of things like making workshops for photo books, dummy making, you know, bazaar, bazaar for exchange, talks on photo books. In short, you have to create the desire. It's no, it's no, you have to create the desire for wanting the book. It's, it's, and making the book and distributing the book. It's not like you just put a hundred books together in a space and then that your problem Hopefully is that people. No, no, I mean that, I don't believe that will solve your issue because it's, if you really, your interest is to create, I mean, Awareness. the way I understand it, like, yeah, you, you want to create a group of people with a desire for the book. And it's not just photographers. Huh? I mean, it's also audience. You see, it's not, I mean, I'm not talking about photographers. I'm, I'm, photographers is actually, in fact, only a very small part of the photo book equation. True, true. Yeah. I mean, the, if you don't have audience, if you don't have bias, you know, the, the I think the, the, the fundamental reason why Indonesia have a, a, a small flourishing is because they have bias. Their, their internal that. public, their internal public, however small it is, can consume what they produce. And that's enough. True. Yeah, you don't need 1,000 or three, I mean, you don't need 35,000 readers or buyers. All you need is what you produce, you can consume. That's that's the beauty of the self-publishing because they don't have this uh, financial commitment that they have to take care of like logistic and stuff. No la, I oh, mean in fact in in fact in fact it's in fact all these are hidden costs. Self-publishing there are plenty of hidden costs. Yeah, I mean unless you are unless you want to self-publish five hundred copies and put at your home and make it yellow, then that's fine. <laughs> you know, but there's a lot of yeah, yeah. hidden costs. I think uh, Flannery has another... a question, uh, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So should I read it? 
I have years yeah. of works that has been in the dungeon for years and have been away from the circle. Let's say I have hundreds of prints. How can I showcase my work beside publish or post it on social media? My... I don't have... I mean, again, this is like... I don't have any rec... I mean, I don't have any specific recommendation because if I say something, it will seem like I'm prescribing a way. But I think the, 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 I think, I guess the basic question about showing in any form, social media or IG or even printing a book or exhibition, right? Or, I mean, it's really, for me, the, the question is really whether there is any point of showing, right? I mean, whether there is any meaning for you to show this. I mean, just because you have images doesn't mean you need to show it. I mean, I, I mean, I, like if your family is somewhat lower middle class who in the past 40, 50 years have gone to the photo studio and has taken a compact camera whenever they went on a family trip, right? It's likely that you will have 50 or 60 images in your family album. That doesn't mean that you show that. Right? I mean, of course you can show them. I'm not saying you can't, but I'm just saying that I'm just saying that just because you have images doesn't mean that you should show them or you need to show them. Uh, I mean, whether there is a point. I mean, it's just not, I mean, it doesn't mean that I have 100 images, so I should show them. I mean, why? What's the point? So I think that's my answer. That's something that I can <laughs> can put myself in that kind of situation also. Mm. I mean, we already have too many people showing photographs of their food or what they make at their dinner table as though it's so damn interesting. Yeah. We we don't need more noise. Unwanted noise, unrelevant. Yeah. I mean so I'm not saying that so for Flanagan, I'm not saying that you can't show, but I think you you probably the question can be flipped around and you can ask yourself what's the point. But now with the internet, it's quite easy to share stuff also. Yeah. That's yeah. the thing. With the internet, it's also quite easy for me to turn off. You mean right? like turn off? Turn off, turn off the computer. And don't see. Oh. But then, oh, yeah, yeah. It depends on your line of work. Some people... No, I just don't see. Don't... You don't have to turn on your Facebook one. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, or you don't have to turn on. I don't have IG, so I don't see. <laughs> yeah. well, good for you. <laughs> good for you, Bin. Yeah. IG is a bit more of a, like a double edge. Some sort of way, it's a way to connect with people. Some way, it's also trying to show to people. It's not just in photography, architecture as well. If it can, now it becomes even more trying to show the beauty, the beautiful things without actually discussing the critical things that need to be discussed. No, la, for sure there is use for it, right? Yes, I mean, I'm is, not yes. saying that there is no use for I mean, I'm on Facebook, right? I mean, it's not as though I'm not on <laughs> social media or something, but I'm just saying that, yeah. I'm just saying that, uh, so this is really only f advice for myself, not, I'm not giving advice for anybody, but. Yeah, uh, but, it's, a, it's uh, a good point though. It's a good, very good point. Yeah, I mean, I, it's just maybe for me, I cannot handle. Is already too much, but for other people, they can. So it's uh, it's, it depends on personal preference, huh? yeah. The personal needs, uh, but since we are on that matter, uh, then compared to the many uh, many years ago, like mm. let's say 20 to 30, 30 years ago, how have you seen uh, the impact of this uh, internet uh, social media affect the way we actually present photography works? I mean, like, in your opinion, I mean, now it's getting easier, of course, 
now we don't need to go through the traditional method of uh, contacting photo editors, things like that. We don't need to go to the mainstream. Then in the future, you don't have to write, maybe you don't have to write letters. Yeah, maybe maybe the interesting point is, uh, what do you think is going to happen in the futures? Uh, in the, I don't know. In the don't way... ask me to predict the future. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a fortune teller. That's a very interesting point. Though. I mean, like interesting thing happening. Everything is very fast. I, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I'm not a fortune teller. <laughs> Actually, a lot of my work concerns about looking at the past, not looking at the future. So I'm not sure, not sure what what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, we we can we, we can we can only say that we can only say that photography will get easier and easier. That's for sure. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. That's good. That's good. That's good. Camera yeah. now is the size of iPhone. Yeah. That's, the icon is going up. Yeah. But what will happen really? I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to say something here and and sound like I'm a stupid idiot for saying that. Yeah, understand, understand. Mm. I think then uh, for those viewers still with us, uh, do you guys have any question? Maybe we, uh, sit, uh, turn turn away, turn off the session by eleven. Would be? Are you okay with yep. that? We are we are coming to eleven already. But five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if there's nothing to say. We can we can go off. Yeah. Because Jabat wants to, Jabat wants to uh, treat us to mamak. <laughs> we uh, uh, yeah, maybe you can ask him for coupon. Then we can go to KK next time. We can claim it. Oh, I'm waiting for him to, I'm waiting for him to uh, bring me to his usual mamak in uh, Koko, Kota Kinabalu. Is. Yeah. Oh yeah! Since we are uh, on this session, well, we'll be just asking. Mm. I'm doing this work on this. Uh, this is not photography work. This is more of my architecture research. It's it's a Cantonese community in Georgetown, Penang. Mm. Do you have any advice? I mean, like any tips on where can I get those uh, reference for Chinese tra journey from the mainland China to Penang? Are you so, far, so many? Cannot... So many yeah, lah. I mean, that, that's like that's that's the thing. They 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 don't have those very specific things. They are mostly referring to the, uh, the famous clan, you know, the of big course. big clan. Of but course. I don't cannot get the small small like Cantonese Cantonese uh, Chinese in, Georgetown. Have you? I I don't know what's the situation in Georgetown, right? Uh, your good friend is helping you, I guess. Oh, who, who, who's my friend? Your good friend, ah. Uh, I need to read her name. Uh. Oh, oh Chin Sena. Yeah. Uh -huh. If she's no, if she's, she's no, she's not Penang Penang Lang, uh. She's not from Penang. No, I guess you you, I mean, first of all, you, you, there are already a lot of published research on on migration relating to Penang. So I I guess that's. That's the that's the main place that you should go to get a big picture, but I think you sh definitely should see if there is that that I'm I'm quite sure that there, there would be a, a kind of Cantonese association or at least a, oh yeah yeah Cantonese association yeah, and see if they have because I'm not working directly on Penang so I cannot immediately say but I'm quite sure they have some they have some uh oral history accounts because they will usually what they will do is they will publish a, every few years if there is a clan association right they will publish a kind of like a commemorative volume oh, oh. for every 50 years or 60 years or 55 years or some of them publish every year so you're not okay, okay. and you're you're not just only looking at the clan association you're also looking at the place association because it could be also a place association they may not be Cantonese association right they could be Zhongshan or, you know, or, you know, it's, it's named after a place in Canton. So it could be place association. Uh, and it could be also Butterworth, you know, because the, the, the account could be in Butterworth rather than Penang. Uh, I see. Also, you should probably look at the heritage. I mean, you should see the heritage people, see if they have done, because I know they have a, 
Do, they yeah, have they do, oral they history archive, right? They do. They do. Yeah. Uh, so usually in those places you will find. I mean, hopefully you will find. You know. Uh. More personal accounts of people who are not so famous, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, and then of course, you That's should definitely search in the Chinese papers. There's a problem you, with someone not 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 fluent in Chinese, but trying to research about the. Chinese so you culture. you have to ask her for help. You ask your friend for help, or you, or you of course you begin by you begin by searching in English. So you have two ways, lah. Basically, for newspapers, you have two ways. You start with the, because it's Penang, right? So some of the Penang archive is actually in Singapore. So you start with the Singapore's digital newspaper archive, hosted by the National Library. So if you go to, I think, eResource or eResources. dot gov. dot sg, and then I think it's then you can look for e newspaper. They have scanned most of the. Major newspapers until 1990, because the the colonial period, the the papers here will report on Penang as well. Obviously, right? When 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 we are both, well, when you know during Malaya, and during the yeah, colonial Singapore, period, definitely Singapore anything happened. Happen. Yeah, anything happened that in Penang, it will be also if it's big enough, it will be reported in the English papers. So you can first start with the you can still first start with the because it's it's all digital you can easily search. So you can maybe search. Can you repeat? I'll send you later lah. I send you later. Oh okay okay. That is easier. So so then you you start with that and then you start with English. Then of course the microfilm. And anyway that that e resource you can search in Chinese. So you need some help. Somebody looking, reading Chinese for you lah. Then you will be able to search for the Chinese newspapers. It will be. Because the Chinese newspapers basically they have Xinqiu and、uh, Nanyang Shangbao all the way until they merge in Singapore, which is after sixty five. So before sixty five, they all have. So you, if you search for Penang Cantonese, you might be able to find something. Then of course you have microfilm. Microfilm is more tough because microfilm you really have to look through everything. So, so it's a yeah. yeah so you. Yeah, you don't. Of course, you don't start with microfilm first. You start with the digital archive first. Okay. Yeah, because a lot of Malaysian stuff, perhaps you will find in Singapore. the Singapore newspapers. I mean, it's not the Singapore、like. newspapers, lah. Actually, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a repository kind of stuff. No, I mean, it's, it covers the whole territory, right? Whole area. Oh. Yeah, what、well, I mean, of course,、yeah. before sixty five. And even actually after sixty five, they still cover. Oh, yeah. Then of course you microfilm. Then you have to look for Penang specific papers, which actually our national library in Singapore also has some of the Penang specific newspapers in microfilm. But I'm quite sure Malaysia somewhere you will be able to find a resource of microfilm newspapers to specific to Penang, Penang, published in Penang. Maybe try my library, my university. What's that? Okay, okay. Okay. Eleven. Okay. Eleven. Chun chun. So、yep. I think、uh, just do a like a closing kind of a speech. So I think want to thanks everyone who are still with us until eleven,、uh, and I also want to thanks、uh, Wu Bin、uh, for taking his time to actually give a very insightful. And informative lectures or the ways of documenting, especially in、uh, for reference to、uh, photographer from Southeast Asia. So, hopefully, maybe next year we can see each other once the pandemic is over. We mean, Inshallah. That's it. <laughs> Wait、okay. for Jabat.、Mm. I think that's、Thanks. it. Thanks. Thank you.